All right, sorry, let's resume. I think that's okay. All right, so if we are computing a single score, which is to say something like the area to the left of a given cutoff, then then this is a probability. Probability Z is less than or equal to some number. Now this number here is called Z naught in most of the stuff that we did last week. This week it will be a specific value from your problem. And if the probability that you want is for Z, which is the random variable, the generic thing, the area, to be less than or equal to a given cutoff Z naught, then it's really simple. Just use PNORM. That's what PNORM does, is it computes the probability corresponding to the area to the left of the input. Give it an input, and it goes off, and it computes the area moving to the left. That's all it can do. To the right of a single score, so if you wanted to flip this around and you wanted to compute this area up here, and this was Z0, so this is probability that Z is greater than or equal to Z0, you have to use the symmetry and the knowledge of the problem, which says that the total area under that curve is exactly one, because it's a probability. And this has all the probabilities of all the different events. So if you want this probability up here that is colored in, it is one minus this probability right there. So you compute the thing that PNORM can actually do. You take PNORM of Z naught, and you do one minus that value. And that will give you the result to the left instead of to the right. Similarly, if you want an area here that is between two numbers, then if this is Z2 and this is Z1, remember, all you have is a tool that goes to the left. So you have to be clever. And you have to come up with a way to compute two areas to the left, which together will give you that area in the middle. And this is what I showed in that video last week. If you compute this area, which corresponds to the probability that Z is less than or equal to Z2, so that's the yellow bit, then that is more than you want. It's more area than you need but it includes the area that you actually desire, the bit in the middle. And how much extra do you have? This bit here is extra. You didn't actually want it, but you got it anyway. What is that? That's the area that is to the left of the second of the two numbers that's given in the problem. And so we will subtract away the probability that Z is less than or equal to Z1. So you take the area from here all the way down, and then you subtract the bit that was extra, which is the area from Z1 to the left. So the actual function call for that thing there is P norm of Z2, all of the area to the left of Z2, all the way to minus infinity. And then you subtract away the P norm z1, which was the extra stuff you didn't actually want, which was from z1 on down. And that gives you from z2 to z1. So that was about half of last week's assignment, was just doing that over and over and over again. Yes, question? Will z2 ever be less than z1? If it was, then the problem is exactly just flipped. Because all you've done is change the labels then. Whichever one is higher is just the one that I labeled as z2, right? So if, if those were, were a different order, then that's fine. You just take the p norm of z1 minus the p norm of z2 in that case. You take the one to the right, take its p norm, which gives you a big area that's too big, and then you subtract away an area that's smaller, which is the stuff that you got by mistake that you didn't actually want, the stuff that's in the blue there. Question? You have, uh, you Okay, so the question is, what if we had three different things which were numbers? We would never do that. 
That, that, that won't happen. You need a Z without any subscripts in there somewhere or you're not computing a probability. You've got to let Z run from somewhere. Now, what you are sort of asking is what if I did something, so here's a normal curve. What if I did something like this and I wanted that area? So that, that gives you a bunch of constants going around. So maybe they're Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. And you want all break it into sub pieces. Each sub piece is no more than two. And then you compute that one alone. Yes, question at the back. Symmetric numbers? Yeah, so if they're symmetric, that's when you get to use a bit of symmetry in the problem, and that was the intention of that problem that you saw in the assignment last week. What, what she's asking about is the example where the numbers aren't even given necessarily, I think what she's asking anyway, but it's something like negative Z0 and Z0, and you're told this area in here is something, and you're asked to find it. That's actually the inverse normal problem. We'll talk about that in about 10 minutes if that's what you were asking about. If these are given, then it doesn't matter if they're the same number. It works exactly the same way. You just treat it like this, and you just do the higher one, P norm, minus the lower one, P norm, and the difference is the area between them. And I posted a PDF to Slack last week, which was just three blank normal curves. Like I drew pictures that were nice on a computer that you could, and if you print that out, you can actually just it, arbitrarily label them and then sort of sketch it in and fill it out. It was just supposed to help you learn how to draw those pictures. You are supposed to draw those pictures. You're not supposed to be able to stare at it really hard until it just works. You need some intuition. And so the intuition comes from draw a picture and go, okay, so the bigger number's over here because it's a positive number and it's bigger than zero. And the smaller number is also positive. Okay, so it's over here too. And then you color in between them. You're like, the number should be like 0.2 roughly, just based on my picture. Let's do the computation and find it. And when you get 0.9, you're like, I might have done something wrong. And then you stop and you go back and you fix it. So the picture is the intuition. Once you've done it for 10 years, you can just stare at it and do it without drawing a picture. You are strongly encouraged to do a picture. If you get this question on a quiz, like you did last week, or if you get a different variation of a question on a quiz or an exam coming up, draw a picture, please. Your intuition is not strong enough to just do it free, frame, free form, unless you've done a lot of them. And in that case, well, fine. You know that you know what you're doing. But if you're at all worried, the picture should always be your first step. Label everything you have and then try and figure out whether it's a forward normal or an inverse normal. All right, let's try some of these. I'm actually going to work through the first, like I said, the first 30, 45 minutes, we're just going to do some of these just to reinforce the concepts. So if I told you that the normal model of script N 160, 75, so that actually tells me that this is the mean and this is the standard deviation, is a good approximation of women's heights in centimeters. So this says that the average height of females is 160 centimeters with standard deviation of seven and a half centimeters. Under this condition, what is the probability that a randomly selected woman from a population has a height greater than 175 centimeters? So this is the probability if this randomly selected woman's height is x, this is the probability that x is greater than 175. Now notice I used x there, not z. That's very, very deliberate. Like we said two weeks ago, we introduced the normal. Every time you see a Z, you're automatically in a standard normal distribution, which is centered at zero. So if you see a Z, it's automatically a standard normal distribution. Because we know that we're not, we're in a normal distribution centered at 160, we need X, something that isn't Z. You can call that whatever you want. Call it T, you can call it U, you can call it V, A, B, C, doesn't matter, but not Z. So the probability that x is greater than 175. What did I say? Draw yourself a picture. So we draw ourselves a little picture. We center this at 160. So that doesn't actually need to be a full line. It just needs to be a tick. And then we say, OK, 175, that's bigger than 160. It means we're over here. And we want greater than. So that means this area. Ballpark, what number are we looking at? 0.7, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20, 0.21, 0.22, 0.23, 
Point three? Point two? Point three, point two, point one, somewhere in there is what we expect to get. Maybe a bit smaller because your intuition about how far over exactly it is is not always great, but it's definitely smaller than point five. We know that. That's what we expect to get. Now, we can't do direct P norm here because we don't have an area to the left. And P norm only does areas to the left. So what do we do? We flip it around. And instead of finding the area to the right, which we want, we instead will compute this blue thing. And that's going to be P norm of 175. Now, 175 is not a Z. So if you put in something that's not a Z, you have to explain to p-norm what kind of thing you're putting in. So we have to specify that the mean is 160. This is called an argument to the function. And then we have to specify that the standard deviation is 7.5. And, and if we run that, that will give us an area representing the blue, which will be ballpark 0 0.7, 0 0.8, somewhere in there. And then 1 Switching back to the red, 1 minus that will give us our area there, which will be one of these four numbers now. Let's find out which one. So I do 1 minus the p-norm of our 175 at mean 160 and standard deviation 7.5. And, and that ends up being, as it turns out, our intuition wasn't so great, but it is still small. We know it's small, 0 0.022, which makes this the correct answer. And that is how you do this problem. You do all of those steps and you take it slow until you start to feel bored. Then you know you understand it, you're not getting anything wrong, and you start dropping some of the steps out. And you go, oh, okay, I know this is just one minus. I can just jump right to that step. Or I don't even need to picture. I know exactly how this problem is working. But I would strongly encourage you to just sketch the tiniest little picture because your intuition is still very young and does not really understand all of the variations of this problem just yet. By the end of the year, by April, I expect you'll kind of, this will be old hat. All right, what about another version? What if I wanted to find the probability that a randomly selected woman from this class, given this normal model, has a height between 155 and 170 centimeters? Again, draw a picture. There's our normal. It's centered at 160. Our numbers 155 and 170 are to the left and to the right of that center line. So we put in a line here, we say you are 155. We put in a line over here, we say you're 170. This is the area we want. P norm only computes areas to the left. So how many P norm calls do we need to compute this guy? Two. We have to start at the upper, up here, and compute the area all the way down to there. And then we have to subtract away this area there. So let's do it. First call is going to be the P norm of the upper. So P norm of 170 with a mean of 160 and a standard deviation of 7.5. Sorry, yellow isn't a great color. <laughs> I'm going to show you the actual code in just a sec. This is just our handwritten version. And then we subtract the p-norm of 155, also centered at 160, also with a standard deviation of 7.5. One area minus the other area. So this is the actual diagram done to scale. And without a computer, it's really hard to actually get this stuff to scale. I do a horrible job. I just flail in there. I just put it somewhere. As long as it's in the right half of the diagram, that's all that really matters in terms of your intuition. So this is what it would actually look like. There was our center line. Here was our far right line. Here was our left line. This was the area we actually wanted to find. Ballpark, what do you think that is? 0 0.9? 0 0.8? 0 0.7? 0 0.6? 0 0.5? 0 0.4? Somewhere in there, 0.4 to 0.6. We're not really sure whether that's half the thing or not, but it's kind of, it's about half. So if you get a 0 0.05, something went wrong. If you get a 0 0.9, something went wrong. 0.65. Okay, that, that meets our intuition. We go, yeah, I buy that. That's 65% of that total area. Cool, 
That's our result. So P norm of 170 from 170 all the way to the left minus the P norm of 155, which subtracts away the unnecessary portion of the area. And for P norm, that's about it. That is every variation of the problem we can ask you. We can ask you to the left, to the right, or between two things, and we can do it either for Z or for X. That is the extent of those problems. And so between the last assignment and the current assignment, you have seen every variation of a P-norm problem now. In excruciating detail, actually, because we've repeated every single one at least twice, sometimes three times. Question, yes? So this is something that yeah, like people are starting to wonder, OK, it's six weeks in. We don't have a midterm. What happens on the final? On the final, you obviously don't have a computer. So you will not be expected to pull these numbers out of thin air. Either we will provide you a small sheet with a bunch of different p-norm calls and their answers, and you'll just be like, well, I need this p-norm call, and you'll go to the list of 20, and you'll find the one that you need, and you'll copy it over. Or we'll simply ask you to write down what you would do, and that's it. And the actual number is mostly irrelevant, right? It's just a process. It's showing you know what you're doing. And so I can give you a multiple choice that says, here's four calls in R. Which one is the one that you need? Circle, next question. So if you learn what you're doing, you'll be totally fine for the final. Don't stress about that. We chose this year to get rid of this whole looking things up in tables thing because you will never do it again. It has been 15 and a half years since I learned this material for the first time, and they told me how to look things up in tables. I have never looked something up in a table since, except when teaching this class. So what was the point of it? Why did, I, why did I learn it? Why would I teach you it? So we got rid of it completely. We just said, you know what? You will always have access to a computer if you're doing actual science. So what is the point of these tables? And so I'm not going to test you on 10% of the exam on can you look up numbers in a table, which is a useless skill you will never use again. What I will do is test to see whether you know how to do the problem. And that you can do without actually doing the problem. You had a question as well? So OK, that's a great question. So looking at this thing, the total is 1. And this is the halfway point. So this is 50%, and this is 50%. So they're both 0.5. So you kind of look at it, and you go, well, most of the area, remember last class, the empirical rule? Six, you may have missed that little bit. It was toward the end of last class. But 67% of the data is plus or minus 1 standard deviation from the mean. And you know that. So what that means is that if I switch colors, actually, let me highlight. So if I go down 7.5 from this, which is down to here, and up to here, that is 67%. So if it's about that size, you know it's kind of 60 70% of the data. And that's because it's in this big central hump. The area down here is actually really, really small. Really, all you need is kind of within 0.5. Is this around 0.5, bigger than 0.5, or less than 0.5? And if you do the problem right, then you're kind of like, oh, it's a lot less than 0.5. Oh, well, that's kind of about what I would expect. And it's just a, it's not even necessary. I'm never going to ask you to do it for marks. But it's a way for you to check your work and go, does this make sense? I just got an area of 0.9. That's, that's big. Is that supposed to be big? That's kind of, it's just a, a, a rule of thumb for trying to prevent you from making silly typos. That's all. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Yep. It's a possibility. So the question is, if, if you expect it to be around a half and you end up with 0.9 or 0.2, is that a bad thing? Yeah. It's a sign that either your intuition was wrong about the way the problem is laid out, or you did something wrong in the computation. And either way, it's a, it's a warning flag. And you stop and you go, OK, well, now why did those not match? Am I wrong in what I think this problem is? Or did I just do something wrong as a typo? 
Either way, you want to fix it, right? Especially on an exam where you get one shot at the problem. It's not so much a problem on our assignments, because if you do it wrong, it'll be like, nah, and you have to do it again. But on the exam, you get one shot, and so you want to kind of have these intuitions to go, OK, this is like, it's a big chunk in the middle. So I know it's like around a half. It may be bigger than a half or smaller than a half. I'm not 100% sure, but it's like, it's bigger than 0.1, but it's not 90%. And so then you look at it, and you're like, ah, 0.6. All right, I buy that. But if it's 0.95, you're like, whoa, that doesn't match at all. I'm a little worried that maybe I did something wrong. And it takes you back through, and you kind of think about it again. And the empirical rule, if you actually want to take the time and you are allowed a calculator on the exam just for doing you know, basic algebra and stuff like that. If you want to take the time, you can actually ballpark your thing by using the empirical rule. Figure out how many standard deviations over each thing is, and then you know about how much of the data that is. Because plus or minus 1 SD is 67% of the data, and plus or minus 2 SD is 95% of the data. Those are just two empirical rules which give you a chance of going, OK, I think it's lower than 67%, bigger than 67%, around 95%, or just big, and then you go with it. Again, you don't spend a lot of time on this, but it is a quick check that you can do without too much effort to check your work. All right, so what if we want to flip this around? And this is where people really started to struggle on the assignment last week. So if the above problems we're OK and straightforward. We have measurements. We have Zs. We have Xs. We have numbers. And we're asked to find probabilities or areas. And that's all p-norm. If the problem flipped things around and says, here's an area. Here's a probability. Tell me the Z. Tell me the X. That's the inverse problem. You're working backwards now. You're given the area and asked, what was the cutoff that made that area happen? And these are done using the QNORM function, which just goes backwards. The syntax for QNORM is exactly the same as PNORM. The number you want to analyze in first, the mean second, the standard deviation third, works exactly the same, except that the first argument, the first thing you put in, is a probability, which means it has to be between 0 and 1. If you put in 1.6 as your first argument to QNORM, it's just going to cack and die and say, what are you asking me to do? That's not a probability, stupid. And you have to stop and go, oh, right, of course it isn't. I gave you the wrong number. So that first number that you put into QNORM has to be a probability between 0 and 1. So we can include the mean and the standard deviation to directly generate that from a given distribution. So let's try a couple of examples of this. So uh, before we do that, I just want you to kind of be able to identify the problem. So just from a word problem, identify whether this is a normal model using p-norm or an inverse model using q-norm. So if a clothing store manager, we know that the heights of men also follow a normal model, just like the heights of women. So if a clothing store manager wonders what percentage of her customers are taller than 190 centimeters, six feet, what kind of problem is that? This is a normal. She wants a percent. Percents are like proportions, or like probabilities, or like areas. She's looking for the area to the right. So this is a P X greater than 190, which is a normal. What if she wants to cater to the tallest 20% and wants to know what heights she needs to accommodate in her stock of suits? This is inverse. She wants the top 20%. She doesn't know what height cutoff that is. She's trying to find it. So this is where you have P of uh, X being greater than or equal to X naught is equal to 0.2. And this is the inverse normal. What about what height is the 90th percentile of men? Inverse again. So in this case, this is 0 0.90 equals the probability that x is less than or equal to x naught. It's the percentile. 90th percentile means 90% below you, 10% above you. So the probability of x being less than or equal to that particular cutoff is 0.9. That's the percentile. What about what percentage of men are shorter than 160 centimeters? This is normal because we could write this 
as the probability of x being less than or equal to 160. So if you know, you notice, notice what's happening here. If you know the number in here, turns into the normal. If you know the number out here, it's an inverse normal. That's the way the problems are set up. So if you can state the problem and you know the thing inside the probability, it's a normal. And if you state the problem and you don't know it, but you know the number that is equal to, that's an inverse normal. One is a p-norm, one is a q-norm. All right, let's do some actual solve problems like this. So, oh, sorry, before this, um, logic. So if the area given is to the left and this area is provided, that's how q-norm works. Q-norm works to the left. It says the area to the left of the number I'm about to give you is the number you gave me. So q-norm, this is just q-norm of the area and it will give you back this cutoff. If you have one to the right, Q-norm doesn't work that way. So it's flipped. So if it's over here, instead what we do is we switch things around and we say, well, what about all this? I'll do the Q-norm of that. And so this one minus the Q-norm of the yellow area. So we say Q norm of the yellow area, except, sorry, it isn't, um, sorry. It's just the Q norm of the yellow area, which is actually, and what, what this is actually saying, sorry, is it's the Q norm of one minus the red area. Because we know that the total area is one, so if you know the red area and it's given to you in the problem, the yellow area is 1 minus the red area. And so you take the Q-norm of that yellow area. Yes, question? No, Q-norm doesn't give you percentiles. It's not designed to give you percentiles. Yes. So if it's a percentile, you have to convert it into an area. You can't do it as a percentile, 90th percentile, 95 percentile. It doesn't make any sense. So if you knew that this was, say, and, and what you're asking about is a very specific subtype of question. If you said the Z such that it is the 87th percentile, what you would do is Q-norm of 0.87. Because you know that the 87th percentile, these problems, the percentile problems, it tells you how much is to the left. And that's 87%, which is 0.87. Q-norm of 0.87 will give you the right answer. So the percentile ones are actually the easiest ones because they're already set up in the probability form and, and they already tell you the percentages on one side. The trickier ones are the variations on the percentiles like what is the height of men such that 10% of men are taller than that height? And it's just a little bit flipped around, and you have to think about it for a second. You say, okay, that means 10% of the area is to the right, 90% is to the left. Q norm of 0.9, done. You just have to do that one little bit of translation in your head. Yes, question? It only works on Zs, yeah. Is that what you were asking? Well, yeah, because I figured, like, if, if it works in the, what the R already has, then you have your own Yes, OK. So th that is absolutely correct. You, you have to be careful. This is for the Z t type of variation. So that's only for Z. Uh, you can do the same thing, but it's a bit trickier when you're in the X world. And we usually, like, we try and set them up so that there's not only one thing to do in each sub problem. But, but yeah, you can get quite tricky, so you do have to be careful. That's for Z with the one minus. Yes. And then between two symmetric scores, we have not and will not give you a variation that is a Q norm of two non-symmetric scores because it actually can't be done with that amount of information. You need one more piece of information to be able to do it, and, and that's just too messy. So symmetric scores, the key here is that we have symmetry. So we have symmetry, which means this area and this area, the area to the left and the right of the center, are exactly the same. 
which means these are exactly the same, which means 1 minus this purple area gives you the area that is left over outside the middle. You take that and you divide it by 2, and that's what goes in the question marks. Do you see that? If you get that, you understand how the symmetry of these problems work, and you're basically done this, this type of problem on the course. We have an area in the middle. It's a symmetric area. So that means the area to the left of it, the un uncolored area, and the area to the right of it are exactly the same. So figure out how much the total leftover area is, 1 minus what you have. Divide that number in half and put half of it over here, half of it over here. Then the problem is fully labeled. And to find these numbers here, we do Q norm of that one because Q norm works to the left. And that will give you a negative number. So Q norm of question mark will, e this question mark, so question mark sub one, will be a number. And that number will be, it'll be negative and it'll be less than 0 0.5 by the construction of the problem. Now, the way these problems are worded is it says, OK, you just found negative Z naught. So negative Z naught equals negative 0.3. What's your answer? 0.3. So the, the equation that you end up getting then is that negative Z naught equals, for example, negative 0.3. Then the answer that you want is Z naught, and so you say Z naught is then 0.3, and that's your final answer. And that tripped up a few people on the assignment, but most people kind of figured it out with the seven attempts. They did it, they're like, what's going on? And then they realized, so oh, it's asking for Z naught, and the numbers are negative 0.3 and positive 0.3, and the one that's Z naught is actually the positive one, so that's my actual answer. All right, let's try a couple of these with some actual numbers. So if the normal model for women, 167.5, is a good description, what height is the break point for the top 10% of women? Draw yourself a picture. So we draw a little normal curve. We put it at 160. Put a cutoff here. We fill in this area. We know that area is 10%. We don't know what that number is there. That's the setup of our problem. So Q norm only works to the left. So what do we plug into Q norm? 0.9, the thing to the left. So this area that's left over here is 0 0.90. So we have Q norm of 0 0.90. The area to the left of the thing that I want is 90%, 0.9. Tell me what it is. But are we in a Z land? No. So. We say, but my mean is 160 and my SD is 7.5. And, and if we do that, which one is the answer? You already know. Process of elimination, look at the four options. Which one's the answer? Can't be that one. That's way to the left. Also, women five centimeters tall? No. Negative height? 150 is less than the mean. That means it's on the left-hand side. We already know it has to be 169. And if we do the Q norm computation, 169.6. So the break point in our model here for women who are in the top 10% of heights among women is 169.6 centimeters, which shows that maybe our model isn't a great model. Actually, that's a fairly high height. You know, that's 5'7" for the top 10%, so maybe that's not quite right. Another one. Here's this, this problem. This is the only type of problem we're going to ask you like this on QNORM with the double-sided. If we are told that the value of the standard normal random variable Z0 such that the area between minus Z0 and Z0 is 0.5285, what is Z0? Draw a picture. Always draw a picture until you get to the point where you feel like the picture is telling you nothing. Set it at zero, because we have Z. We are told that this is Z naught. We are told that this is minus Z naught. And we are told that this area in here 
is 5, 2, 8, 5. Next question is, what's this? What is the quantity of the area that is labeled in yellow? So we know that it is a Q-norm inverse problem because the only number, or rather the number that's provided, is the area. So if you're given the area, you've got to be working backwards. And so I didn't know exactly what it was doing, but I just worked my way through the problem. So what you do to work through the problem is you start and you say, okay, I want a probability. I know how big it is. What is it between? It is between a number which is a negative Z0 and a Z0. I don't know what those are, but I can still draw them on my picture and label them. And so I did. I put a negative Z0, a positive Z0, and then I said, well, okay, so the probability is between them. It's bigger than negative Z0, but it's smaller than or equal to Z0, so it's in between them, so it's in here. And oh, I know what that's equal to. It's there. So that's how far you get when you're just sort of setting up the diagram from the problem. And you can always do that. Whatever the statement is, you can always do that far. The jump to the yellow is the part that's actually the memorization. And that's knowing that in a situation like this where you're trying to find a Q-norm, Q-norm only works to the left. So you need the rest of the information on the diagram to be able to work with it, which means I need the yellow. And so the yellow is the leftover area. So leftover area is 1 minus 0 0.5285. That's what's left over. But half of it is yellow, and half of it is the upper half. So this is divided by 2 and goes in there. And so that is 0.4725 divided by 2. So it's about 0.28. So the area is about 28%. 53%, 28%, ballpark. That's off by a little bit. So now we want to compute that thing. So we write the Q norm, which is, I'm going to give you an area to the left. Give me back the number that's the cutoff. So Q norm of the area to the left. The area to the left is the area of the yellow. This will give me... What does it give me? If I, if you had R in front of you, or maybe you do, and you plug that in, what number did that just give me back? Not, not the actual number, but what does it represent? What is it on the diagram? Negative Z0. Yes. It's going to give me negative Z0, which is almost what I want to answer the problem. So let's actually do it. Jump to the next slide. There's our setup, exactly the same way. What do we do? Fill in the different areas, which is what we just did. And do a Q norm of the upper Z0. So this one was Z0. If I ran a very similar argument, which was Q norm of 1 minus 0 0.5285 over 2, this would be negative 0 0.72. So this variation here, what I actually did is I jumped a step and I said, maybe I would make a mistake with the Z0. And I actually said, well, what I want is Z0, this one right here. Let me take the area to the left of that, which is all of this, which was this piece plus that piece. So I took the area all the way up to Z0 and plugged it in, and then I get back right to Z0 immediately, or you can just do that area down in the bottom area, the bottom third, and that will give you the negative version. They're exactly the same. They give you the same number just with the sign, and you just have to interpret your answer. Question? Which number? No. So 0.72 is, in, is a Z. 
If I plugged that into QNorm, I'm going to get something wildly different. People, you're being confused by this being very similar to this sum. It is not. This is a Z. So this only came about because we did a Q norm of an area. This area here was 5285 plus this. You're right, it's around 70.75. But when you do the Q norm of that, this is a Z. It could be 1.5, it could be 1.7, it could be 3. It just happened in this case to be 0.72. So it has nothing to do with the sum of those two numbers. It's the translation of the sum of those two numbers into a Z. You have to pass it through the Q norm, and then it will give you the Z that corresponds to it. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the variation with the Z not being zero is actually a slightly simpler version of the same thing because you know the Q norm of zero and you know the Q norm of 0 0.5. So if you have zero as one of your two halves, the Z not minus Z not business, zero is always right in the middle, which means the area to the left of it is 0.5, the area to the right of it is 0.5. So when you do your diagram, it's kind of irrelevant. It just immediately gives you its piece of the answer and all you have left is the area between there and something. So his question was, what would we do if we had minus Z naught zero and we're told this number here? Well, in that case, you actually know that this is 0 0.5 minus the number immediately because you know that you're at the halfway point. So that's actually a slightly simpler variation where you just immediately know the 0.5 and you proceed. And there's a question, yeah? Yes. These are equivalent ways to find the answer. This one will give you Z naught straight away, which is 0.720. This one gives you minus Z naught. Yes. So th th there's only two variations of this problem that we can ask you with this amount of information. One is the symmetry where they are flipped signs, minus 0.72 and positive 0.72, minus one, positive one, so on. The other one is the one he asked about, which has the zero cutoff. And in that case, you kind of get to cheat because you already know the 0.5 and everything proceeds. Not the answer. But the, you know in that case there, with, with this 0 and negative Z0, you know this area right away without having to do any more work, which means you immediately plug in that area and you're just done. You don't have to kind of do the divide by 2 and worry about which one you're working with. You just immediately go 0.5 minus and you're done. Do you have a question? No, you, you will only have one or the other. You don't never have them together. Either there will be a single Z naught, a positive or a negative. So negative Z naught to zero or zero to Z naught. Or you'll have this variation, which is minus Z naught to Z naught. You can't mix the two of them. It doesn't make any sense. So whichever one you have, if you have just one of them, you automatically know that you're dividing your areas in half and half. And so your diagram gets filled in very quickly. And really, that's all this is for, is to fill in the diagram to get the intuition. In the other case, the diagram is a bit trickier. You have to take what you have, you have to minus it from one, you have to divide by two, you have to fill the stuff in, and then you have to pick which one you want to work with. That one's really simple. You already know it's 0.5, you fill in the other area, you plug it in a Q norm, you're done. That's it. So if you, if you find one of the problems from last week's assignment that you didn't get or that you struggled with, you are more than welcome to drop me a quick Slack message and say, hey, you know, from lecture today, like this problem didn't really make sense last week, still doesn't make sense. Help me kind of figure out what I'm doing, and I'm happy to do that for you. Any other questions? All right. Let's jump.
there was, this is just checking. So if you have access to R on a quiz, you can always go backwards. If you do a Q norm, you can follow it up with a P norm and make sure you did the right thing. So we said 0 0.720 and negative 0.72 were our Z naught and our minus Z naught. So if we had a picture and this was minus Z naught and Z naught, and this is the area between them, we know how to find that area if we know the Z naughts, we plug it into P norm. So I do P norm and then I subtract and I get back exactly what the question said the area was between those two numbers, which means I did the right thing and I'm done. And so uh, keep that in mind for next week's quiz. All right, that is the end of review from last week. And now we have about 25 slides of some new material, which actually wraps up the end of chapter two for the reading week break. So checking normality. A lot for assumed normality. It said, we're going to do this thing, and we're assuming it's normal. Well, you know what they say about assuming things, right? You, you need to be careful. So how do we do this if I just give you data? And I say, here's some data. It's normal. Trust me. Yeah, you don't trust anyone. Don't trust data ever. So we want to check it. We want ways of actually looking at data to determine whether we buy the normality assumption. Two methods, the only two methods we're going to learn. Number one, plot a histogram of the data, and then the normal distribution you think fits it, plot that as well. And I'm going to have you do this in workshop this next week and next cycle, and you actually see how it works. And if the two of them match up, then that's a good sign. It's a sign that actually normal follows the same shape as the histogram. This thing is probably normal, or at least close enough. The other method is to create what is called a QQ plot. And so QQ plots stand for quantile quantile plots, and they are a way of presenting data in order to see whether it looks normal. Now, you will never do one of these by hand, ever. Uh, Excel does support it, so does R and MATLAB and Stata and Statistica and all these other programs. And so in workshop this week, I'm going to show you the command and we're going to work through a couple examples and show you how to do it. But it's a really simple command. It's just Q norm, uh, QQ norm, I think. And what it does is it plots the actual values that you give it on the x-axis and the normal values that would correspond to that particular x on the y-axis, and then it does a scatter plot of a whole bunch of points. If those points follow a straight line, then that means the data is normal. If they are curved, it means the data is not normal. It's a very simple visual check. You plot it, you're like, looks like a straight line to me. Next. Or, whoa, curvature. OK, not normal. I got to stop and think about this problem some more. This is an example of QQ norm in R. When you hand it some data, it will then go ahead and it will plot that data, the actual values of the sample and the theoretical quantiles. And if those two are the same, then you get a y equals x curve. Remember year 12 advanced functions, y equals x plots, y equals mx plus b. If they are the same value for x and y, then y equals x, which is the simplest form of a straight line. So if it's a straight line, then it's normal. Now, you're allowed to have a small amount of fluctuation around this. If a couple points out here, sorry, uh, and a couple points there don't quite match up, that's OK. It needs to be a really, like, you need to be able to draw a curve. Now, there are variations where it does this, and then it does this, and it does that. That's a curve. If you had a variation that looked like this, that's a curve. If it's mostly a straight line with just a couple of points, it's probably close to normal. This is not a very scientific approach. You kind of stare at it and go, looks like a straight line to me. Moving on. So don't argue over QQ plots too, too much. They're not really a like, precise instrument. They're like a hammer. You're hitting it with a hammer. If it stays down, it's dead. Here's an example. Some male heights in centimeters actually measured from some real people. And the histogram 
looks mostly normal. Now, this is where, you know, you could say, well, is it really? Because it, it's symmetric. It looks like it has a center point. Now, this kind of worrisome, right? That's saying it doesn't quite follow, but it's pretty close. So in a case like this, where it doesn't quite match up, where it doesn't go, each of the line points goes through the top of the boxes, and it's really tracking very, very well, you might go, OK. Let's do a secondary plot. Let's check this out. We do a QQ plot. And as you can see, there's a few points here and a couple points there. But on the whole, if you were going to draw a line through those dots, it's a straight line. And so we would say, yeah, this behaves normally. We can use the normal assumptions. We can do normal modeling on this. Another example is house sizes in square feet in Vancouver. Now, Vancouver has some really expensive houses and some really, really big houses. So this is in thousands of square feet. Notice the one at 14 is lit up. There is a house in Vancouver that is 14,000 square feet. That's like seven real houses, like normal houses put together. That it's, it's just like, it's like bowling alleys and indoor car parks and things. Like it's ludicrous, right? So. Is that a normal distribution? Look at the histogram. It's not symmetric. It's skewed. You see that right away. If you were to draw the shape, it goes up and then it goes out. That is not symmetric. It's not normal. And if you plot that on a QQ line, you get a curve. The shape that you follow by just enveloping the points is a curve. Not normal, therefore normal assumptions are violated. You would not use a normal model for this. And if you did, the results wouldn't mean anything. It is related, yes, which we will talk about next semester. <laughs> so if you've ever done anything to do with regression, if you've ever fit a line in Excel for a lab and there was an R squared they told you to report and you had no idea what it meant, it is a similar metric for departures from straightness. But here we don't have a metric, we just have a picture. But it is a similar kind of idea. You're looking for departures to identify a case where maybe you, your assumptions are violated. That's it. That's really all there is to a QQ plot. So we're putting in our company You put in a vector. Oh. It works on a vector. So the call that I did up a couple slides ago here is the QQ norm of y, y was a vector. So you obviously need more than one point, otherwise your scatter plot is just going to be the single solely lone, lonely point in the middle of the, you need a bunch of them. So you know, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, like you need a bunch of points and then you can do it and it'll just happily create it. Now, it's only really valid when you have 30 or 40 points, so you can actually see the shape. If you just have five points, they could all be on the line even though the data isn't actually. So use all of your data. And what we're going to have you do this week is you're actually going to be learning file input output. So you're going to be reading in data from a spreadsheet or a comma separated value file and then checking if it's normal and then doing a little bit of analysis. We're starting to build the complexity up toward the end of the semester when you're actually going to be doing a, a full fledged data analysis in our all on your own for your lab exam. That's, that's the goal of this course is to get you to that point where you are independent in R, sort of. All right, so that is the end of 2.6. The QQ plot is a method for checking normality. That's about it. The last thing we want to talk about from this chapter is application of the normal model to problems and how we go about doing this. So let's, uh, let's go back in time. A couple of weeks. Remember the tapping example? I tap the song. You try and tell what it is, and mostly it just sounds like nothing, and you're like, I have no idea what that sound is. Or sometimes it is a song that you've heard of before depending on you know, how close you are to the person and how good a job they do and whether they're tapping the melodic line or the bass line because the bass line is and it's pretty boring and no one can tell what it is, maybe you do better or worse. Remember we did the proportion of simulated scenarios? It was centered right at the middle at 0.5. And then we said, how many did we have correct again? Three out of 120, which was 0 0.025, which was like over here somewhere. 
and it was very much not in the distribution, and we had strong evidence to reject the null and all that stuff when we did the example, right? So let's revisit this. This shape is very much normal. It's symmetric. It's centered at a value. It's unimodal. It looks like a normal distribution. It actually is. We'll talk more about that in the next chapter after the midterm, about why that worked out the way it did. But it looks normal. So we can actually use the normal method to analyze the problem. We did this whole problem by simulating by pretending that every person was a 50-50 coin flip and then checking to see if that kind of matched what we saw, there is another parallel way of analyzing this problem, which is the way that came before. It's the older method, same as those tables are older methods. This is the older method, and it's still used today in almost every journal paper you will read. So people do this all the time in science. So the idea is that we have a point estimate. So we took our 120 pairs of people and we recorded how many of them got the song right. And that was what we called a point estimate because we are estimating a point. We're estimating a parameter. Now they vary depending on whether I did 120 students at Berkeley like, or Stanford or here at Trent. You know, if I have a different audience and a different set of people and a different level of musical ability, you know, if I chose people from the music school, maybe they're better at identifying rhythms like that and identifying common songs. So that will vary from sample to sample. Depending on which sample you take, the variability will be different. How much variation there is in your estimate. We call this the standard error. This is where the notation starts to get a little bit squirrely because we start to reuse variables with different subscripts and you have to start being careful with your reading. So you already know what the standard deviation is. We call that sigma. And then we did talk a couple weeks ago about estimating the standard deviation from data and we called that S. This is a variation of those which applies only to when we're computing statistics. So this is only for statistics. Remember the definition of statistics? These are things that are computed from your data. So computing the average from your data. Computing the proportion of people who got the song right from your data. Computing how many heart attack victims who had the blood thinner survived is a proportion computed from your data. Something computed from data is a statistic. When we are talking about statistics, they have variation too. Your original data has variation, and that is sigma, which we estimate with S. Your statistic has variation, and that is called the standard error, which we often short form as capital S, capital E. And for the next couple of weeks, that is how we will refer to it. It'll be the SE, the standard error. The way we actually determine it changes from problem to problem. And this is, I actually really like the way the book does the development of these topics because normally in a stats class, you'll do about 11 or 10, 11 weeks of stuff. And then you'll start rapid fire learning a bunch of tests. You'll learn about proportion tests and mean tests and all these things. And they're all actually the same thing, but they never make that clear. And each one has a unique formula and you get to memorize the list of 12 of them for your final exam. And everybody, that's the point where people will start to hate statistics. And like I go around, I am a statistician. I have a PhD in statistics. It's what I do. It's my job. I tell people what I do and they go, oh, I hated statistics in school. I'm like, thanks. What do you do? I hate doctors too. You know, like, like really, come on now. And doctors are the worst. Like every doctor I've ever met is like, oh, stats. Ugh. I'm like, yeah, thanks. Medicine's not so good in itself, you know, right? But the idea is that's the point where it breaks down. You have some intuition and you hit this wall of formulas and you're just like, well, I'm done. You know, you, you, you brute force through to the exam and then you wipe it from your memory because you just cannot be bothered. I like this development better because we're building intuition first and then we're slowly introducing what little formulas we have in a way that I'm hoping you'll see the point and how they're all actually the same. And it's all just one arc of this course. It's just a series of different models used in different situations which all use the same formula. 
So I really like that, and I think, I think the learning outcomes are going to be better. You're going to learn this stuff better than the students last year who did the traditional curriculum. There is one commonality to every or almost every example we will use in this course, and that is the central limit theorem can be applied to find the standard error of your statistic. Now, we talked about the central limit theorem a little bit last week, and the central limit theorem just says as you have more and more data, things behave normally. And so this means if you have a bunch of data and you take the average of it, that average is normal. The data may not be normal, but the average will be. That's the essence of the central limit theorem, is that if you have lots of data of an arbitrary distribution, if you take a statistic of it, as you add more data, that statistic gets more and more normal. And so that gives us a way to approach the normal model for this tapping example. So we had a mean of 60, a standard deviation of 5.4772, and that is actually just the fit to this scaled up to the 120. So this is the simulated proportions that are successful, the proportions being out of 120. So this number here corresponds to 68 of 120. This corresponds to 0 0.7 times 120. This corresponds to 0.3 times 120. And we're saying that actually the center here is at 0.5, and it has a standard deviation, a standard error. And we will talk about how to compute that error after the midterm break, we're actually going to do the formula for it and show you how to compute it from an arbitrary set of data. For now, take it on faith that it does exist. And if you want to flip four more pages in the book, you can actually see it. And these are actually the numbers that come from that simulation we ran on the tapping. The mean was 60 out of 120, or 0.5. And the standard deviation was 5.4772 out of 120, which is a small number. When you scale them, they become 0.5 and 0 0.0456. So that's actually the numbers that are on this plot back here. This is 0 0.0456. This is what we use as the standard error. So you don't have to memorize this yet. We're not going to test you on it or put it on the assignments until after the midterm. But the standard deviation of the statistic is called the standard error. That's the connection. That's how all, they all work together. So you have data which possesses a mean and a standard deviation just because it's data. And then you have a statistic which is a computed quantity from your data. It also has a standard deviation. But to distinguish between them so we can keep track of which one's which, we say that one's called the standard error. It's the standard deviation of a statistic. Now, the implications of this, we've only seen one statistic so far, maybe two. We saw the average as well. The implication is there's going to be a lot of different variations of this. Question, yes? Midterm break. Oh, okay. Like next week. You know how you're not in school next week? That. When we're back on Halloween, classes on Halloween, the 31st, we will start learning about how this works. Sorry, there, yes, there is no midterm examination in this course. There is, however, a midterm break. Yeah, I, I still see people asking questions in Slack, like, is there a midterm? And I'm like, we're six weeks in, and you haven't figured this out yet? Like, the syllabus was pretty clear, and, you know, the quizzes are your midterm. So you have... 11-ish weekly quizzes that count for the same portion that normally would be a big test in the middle of the term. And I think that ends up with better grades, personally, because it's more chances to have a bad day and not completely wipe out 20% of your grade. You only wipe out 2% of your grade, and that's not so bad. All right. So here is an overlaid normal distribution. This is that same plot, but I just kind of cleaned it up so we can actually do it, and I've displayed the normal. Centered at 0.5. Plus or minus one standard deviation, one standard error, which is 0 0.0456. That is a good fit. Notice that the differences here between the blue and the top of the black are not very big. 
That's just showing that actually they fit quite well. It's not perfect, and it will never be perfect because it's an approximation, but it does fit well. So that means that our null distribution of proportions actually behaves normally. And that's the essence of the normal model, which is that instead of doing all that work, setting up that simulation in R, computing 100,000 iterations of people tapping and taking 120 person blocks of them and seeing what proportion succeeded in each of those blocks and then doing all that work in R, you could use this formula and jump right to the end. And this is what people did for 85 years before personal computers with the power of more power than they used to send the people to the moon the first time live in your pocket. You know, this has a quad core processor running at 2.5 gigahertz. Like that's better than any computer I owned prior to 2007. And it's in a phone that I carry in my pocket and used to like look at Twitter. Like, you know, we, we abuse our technology. But without that technology, this was essentially impossible. No one was going to let you book supercomputer time to compute a statistical problem for your honors thesis, right? So you had to have a way of doing it which worked around the fact that you couldn't do the real simulation that would show you exactly what was going on. And that method was the normal approximation. Now, it is an approximation. Now, you're all in some variation of science. So you know about approximations in science. They'll tell you, OK, so this is how this complex ecological model works. And these are all the parameters. That's way too hard to analyze. So we're going to call it this. And we're just going to analyze this little approximation. Approximations are close to but not equal to the truth. And so we have an approximation to our statistical model, which uses the normal distribution as our proxy. And it says. The normal density is very close to the simulated distribution. And remember how we computed the p-values? The p-values are all of the simulations that are out on the tail like our experiment or even further out in the tail than our experiment. That's how we've done it four or five times now. You find your experiment and you go, OK, from here to the end, how many of these simulated values were like that? And that was our p-value. That's how we defined it. That is the formal definition of a p-value. In our approximation, we're going to do the same thing. But we're going to say, well, that shape's kind of like a normal. So instead of counting the simulations out there, use the normal curve and compute a probability out there. And it's almost the same thing. And so what we do is we convert to z our data. So this was our experimental result. This was our null. This was that standard error we computed. And if you put those together, that is the z approximation function. And it gives you a value of negative 10.417. If we then quickly sketch that normal, here's our center. And actually, this is a, this is a z from a standard normal, because we've normalized it by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. So this is centered at 0. This is negative 10.417. The question is, what is this area? So. We just spent an hour reviewing how to do this. How do we find that? Of? Is that the final answer? What else do we have to do to it? You're right. You're not wrong. But, but there's one more step. What's the other step we need to do? Close. Multiply. Because we're not splitting that area up. We're doubling it. We're saying there was some area on one side over here, and there's a symmetry area over there at positive 10 that we need to worry about. But I'm not going to compute that twice. I'm just going to multiply by 2. That's good enough. So that's exactly what we do. P norm of negative 10.41667 multiplied by 2, which is 2.08 times 10 to the negative 25. That is 0.0000. 
zero 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 two. That's the p-value. It's very very small. And that was the p-value, which remember the intuition that's saying this number of our simulations are like the experimental result or even more extreme. This is saying that the proportion is something like one in a hexamillion. You start going up, you're like, okay, so we've got millions, and then billions, and then trillions, and then quadrillions, and then quintillions, and you're still going. You'd have to do this something like, you know, several hundred million billion times before you found a result as extreme as what these people saw in the actual experiment. It just doesn't happen. And so the p-value is extremely small, which says, okay, we absolutely reject the null. There is no way in hell 50-50 is the way that this works. 3 out of 120 versus 50-50 is so extreme, we're just like, nope, not happening. This is not the truth. We reject the null hypothesis, and we go on. Now, what did we find in the simulation? We only ran it a thousand times, and we said, well, we found zero cases in a thousand simulations. We were like, well, we know P is less than one in a thousand, because we didn't even find one case in a thousand. How much less? Well, as it turns out, a lot less. So if you're really, really curious and bored and have, you know, overnight, set your computer up to run a hundred billion iterations of this and see if you find even one, which is as extreme. And you shouldn't. And 100 billion times 100 billion times, and you still won't see a result this extreme. Because I'm dumb. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's just a typo. Sorry about that. Yeah, that was, just, that was just me. The negative was from the negative 10, and I somehow copied it out. It was, it's just, yeah, that means nothing. Good catch, thank you. So this is really, really rare. What this means is if this was the null hypothesis, you would have to do this experiment every day from now till the heat death of the sun to see it happen once just like this. Is that likely? No. Today was not a special day. You didn't get a result that extreme. Obviously, the null hypothesis is false. That's not actually how it works, which is why this doesn't match up. So we do have evidence to reject the null. The proportion is definitely not 0.5. End of problem. So um, there's another example in the textbook, which if you are doing some review and you're just trying to internalize this knowledge, if you have time over the reading week break and you want to read back over the material and just see how far we've come, there's an example in the textbook in 2.73, which talks about a medical consultant who essentially acts as a proxy between patients and doctors in the US where you know private private healthcare happens and she like tries to find people for kidney transplants and bring them to doctors who do kidney transplants and she has a success rate in her kidney transplants that's really high and she wants to claim that actually she's much better and if you go with her you're much likely to have a good result for your kidney transplant and your kidney won't be rejected and you'll live and all these good things but of course she wants money for that and so it, it's a test of whether her actual claims are valid we didn't do it in class but in this case in this one example, it's the one example done in full in the book, where the normal approximation actually fails. And so you can't use the normal approximation. And what used to happen in stats is that when you ended up with cases like this, you had to do all kinds of crazy things and jump through hoops to be able to find p-values and to actually ask questions about this. Our simulation method works regardless. That's why it's so nice, is that once you've done it a couple of times, that simulation method will work for any kind of data. Whereas the normal approximation only works when the data can actually be considered to be normal. And so it's, it's a more restricted method. But as you saw, we had one very simple calculation, which any of you could do in pen and paper if you wanted to. I mean, dividing by 0.0456 isn't fun, but you could do it if you had to. Long division, away you go. Come on, you got an hour. And you could find this number. And then you could use a standard table and you could look it up. And it would be possible to do this entire problem without a computer. 
And that was how it was built to be done in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on, until computers became cheap. And you go, well, wow, my phone isn't cheap. But you know, your phone is also way overkill for being able to do what we're asking you to do here. You can buy a $200 Chromebook, which you do in workshops, and do the same thing. Or you could buy a used laptop off some guy that runs Windows XP and still do all this work. What we have is way overkill for just doing what we do. All right, so, so this is just kind of like breaking this all down and talking about it. So we computed these simulations. I did it in class. I did it in class again and again. You did it in workshops twice. So given that, what's the point of doing the normal approximation? It is faster, significantly faster. You write down one equation, you get a number, you look it up, you're done. You, know, you can do it in two minutes if you know what you're doing. So it is faster. So it only requires a bit of algebra. So this is saying no computer. And you can look the probabilities up in the table. You don't have to compute them. So this let people do stats before computers, before computers were commonplace. But as we've seen in this class, and, and some of my colleagues questioned this, they said, there's no way you're going to get 90% of your students to bring their laptops to workshop. And I said, well, we'll see. And you proved them wrong. You know, we are about 95% of you bring your laptops to workshop because you own a laptop. And I think they hadn't just quite caught up to the world where you, all of you essentially own a laptop. Like, no one thinks of going off to university without a computer. And most of you go, I'd like the convenience and the portability of having the laptop to be able to bring it to campus and to do all kinds of things with it, right? Five years ago, that wasn't true. Ten years ago, that really wasn't true. When I started undergrad, there was only two people in my entire dorm who had a laptop out of 120 of us. Everybody had a desktop, don't get me wrong. We all had computers. You needed one. But only two people owned a laptop. Everybody else had a desktop because laptops were really expensive and really slow. That was in 2001 when I started undergrad. So in the 16 years since then, everybody owns a laptop and we can use them. So computing has gone from being a rare thing or a heavy thing, no one wants to lug a 30 pound tower around and try and find a monitor to hook it up to, to something that fits in your backpack and you take it essentially everywhere. Because without it, you feel lost. You don't know how to do all the things that you do every day. So computing is now ubiquitous. And so that meant we can do this the proper way. And if you go back to the original papers that founded statistics in the 20s and the 30s, they were written to explain this the proper way with the simulations. They're saying, this is how you would compute it exactly. And then over the next 10, 15 years, they're like, but we can't do this. We just don't have the means to do this. It's not possible. Here is the approximation. And then somehow, they almost forgot where they came from. And everybody just assumed the approximation method was all there was. And it's only in the last 10 years that computers have become so ubiquitous that every statistician who's trained is good with computers. You have to be to get through your PhD. And we're starting to realize, oh, why are we doing the approximation when we can get the exact value? And so we're actually gone back full circle to where they started in the 20s. And so this is my first year of running the course this way. And so far, I know we've had glitches and there's been issues. But so far, your understanding level is about 30 or 40% ahead of where it was last year. You may feel like you're a bit lost, but they were really lost last year. Okay, So, so just be aware, like, like because we're integrating all these steps and having you do things so much, you're actually learning. Even if it doesn't feel like you're getting very far, you are learning things and it's working. So uh, a couple more things to talk about. We still got a half hour. Uh, we will, this is just a note, uh, the question about the exam. I've just, I did have it in the slides today. So obviously, you don't have computers on your exam, so you can't compute p norms and q norms. And I, I'd love to just be able to give you your computers and then make everybody turn their Wi-Fi off so you have no communication skills. But unfortunately, there is a subset of the class who would need the Chromebooks, which have to be on Wi-Fi, which kind of eliminates the, the thing. So what we're going to do is just a workaround. But I refuse to teach you an antiquated method that you'll never use again. So no tables. We're just not using them flat out, no. And what we're going to do is just provide you a way to be able to kind of skip that step. So we'll either give you the value and say, use this in the next step, or we'll say, what would you have called in R to actually get the right number? OK, that's the question, and move on. All right, last topic for the day, last topic for the chapter, is the concept of a confidence interval. So in the Tapper and Listener problem, we had three in 120 who correctly identified the song. That is the single plausible value for the parameter. 
We ran our experiment. We're trying to estimate what proportion of the population could, in a pairing, arbitrarily chosen, correctly identify a song. Our estimate, our, our educated guess, and that's all stats is, is educated guessing, is 3 in 120, 0 0.025. That was our guess. But that's not perfect, right? If I re-ran that experiment with you folks in class, maybe we'd get 5 out of 120, or 10 out of 120, or 0 out of 120 because we're all tone deaf. Who knows, right? We'd get something, but it almost certainly wouldn't be 3. And that was the point of the standard error that we mentioned. They're not consistent, right? They have variability. From experiment to experiment, you expect them to be different. So the logical step is instead of reporting this one-off value, which only applies to that one experiment, and saying this is the value of the population, when you know full well it is not, it's just a guess, we're going to provide a plausible range. We're going to say it's probably between A and B. That's a confidence interval. We call this a confidence interval CI. CI is used because we're lazy. So if you see CI in this course, capital C, capital I, it always means confidence interval. So it always will be there. And it's going to be a plausible range of values for the parameter. If I ever ask you a vocab question and I say, what's the definition of a confidence interval? Plausible range of values for the parameter will be fully accepted as a correct answer. It's not the most technical definition, but it is the idea of what we're trying to do. And I'm OK with that. So. Um, the analogy used in the book, which I've reproduced here, is that if we just report the point estimate of 3 over 120, almost certainly that's not the exact true underlying population parameter. It's like fishing in a murky lake where, spearfishing that is, I don't know if anybody's ever spearfished. I haven't spearfished. I've watched it on TV. You take a spear and you try and fish and you're, it's a murky lake and you're like, hold still fishy. And then you throw it in the murky lake and you're like off by three feet, right? So if the value is a fish in a murky lake and you're trying to hit it with one guess, one spear thrown, you're not going to catch the fish. You're not going to get supper. But if I make a net and I go like that, I have a much better chance of catching this stationary fish, which is stationary for some reason. So that's the idea, is that we're going to cast a net. We're going to give a range. And we're going to say the fish, the true parameter, is probably in this area. They are given percentages. They are reported as a certain confidence interval. So confidence refers to how confident you are. So we will have a 95% confidence interval. We will have a 90% confidence interval, an 80% confidence interval, a 99% confidence interval. You have an arbitrary confidence number that you're going to attach to it. This will provide a guide for how large you do it. The more confident you are, 99%, 99.9%, the bigger your area is going to be. Make sure you understand that connection, because that's a great multiple choice question I could ask on the final exam. The larger the percent, the larger the area. They, they scale with each other. So if I have a, if I want to say I'm 99.99% .99 confident, then I need to cover myself. I need to hedge my bets. I need to make that area really big so I'm really, really sure that I actually hit the parameter. Whereas if I say 80%, there's a 20% chance it could be wrong, I'm much more willing to be focused and say, oh, it's just in there, just a little bit. So how do we actually do this? Well, this is the definition. This is the formula. If we want to compute a confidence interval of 95% for a parameter, we take our point estimate, our educated guess, and we add and subtract, that's what this means here, plus minus, add and subtract 1.96 multiplied by the standard error of the estimator. And then we would say that we are 95% confident that this interval captures the true underlying population parameter. Why 1.96? What's that number? We have seen it before. Any guesses? Very good. That's exactly what it is. 1.96 is the number 
such that, go back to the start of the class, 1.96 and negative 1.96 have how much area between them on a standard normal? How much area between? 95%. 0 0.95. That's where those numbers come from. So we're saying we want a 95%. So we take 95% of the normal. We take the numbers that give that, which is 1.96 in this case, and we use that as a scale factor for the standard error, which is distributed normally, so that we end up with 95% of the distribution, which is around the point estimate. Well, in other words, what we're doing is we're giving the Z0 for the point estimates normal, the specific normal that the point estimate is on, such that 95% of the area is between it. It's that same problem we did at the start of the class with minus Z0 and Z0. We're just not using Zs now. We're using Xs because we're on the point estimate standard normal. And so that's why you end up with this as your standard deviation. I'm telling you it is. You could check. It's, it's one of those things that, that you could easily plug into PNORM. It's, it's one of those numbers that by the end of this class you will have memorized just because it comes up so much. There's a few numbers which come up over and over and over again. 1.96 comes up all the time. 2.23 comes up all the time. 1.65 comes up all the time. Those are all numbers on the normal curve that have plus or minus that number being it's one of these nice round 80, 90, 95, 99% numbers. Great question. The question is, if we were trying to do this for a 99% or a 90%, what number would we use? Well, you could do it manually. You could set up a problem, do the minus Z0, Z0, and say, well, which one corresponds to 90%? Or, well, um, let me just jump over this. Sorry, I'm going to just jump. This is the actual standard formula. I'm going to go back to that example and show you. But this is, it's a Z star. We select that Z star, that number, that 1.96 that we just used, or whatever variation we have. So the area between minus Z star and Z star is the confidence. So it does exactly turn in to that Q norm problem that you did on last week's assignment. It wasn't just an arbitrarily chosen difficult problem that I threw at you because I was feeling mean. It's actually because it's something we're going to do a lot over the next year, well, five months or whatever we have. And you're going to be using it over and over again. So I really wanted you to figure out how it worked. So what you do is you set up a normal curve. You set up a Z star and a minus Z star. You fill this in and you say, this is my confidence. So that could be 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 0 0.99, 0 0.26. You can have a 26% confident interval. It'd be weird, but you could do it. It's defined for anything between 0 and 100. And so you put that area in there, and you do the Q-norm process, and you find your Z star, and then it goes into your equation. So that was why we taught you that last week, was so that you'd be able to do this exact thing. All right, jumping back to the practice. So remember the DVD, the behavioral economics problem, where we were, you know, we're trying to see whether you would save money if we just reminded you that if you didn't say it, spend money, you'd have money. Which seemed very silly, but actually it seemed to work. Just reminding you that the act of spending money means you no longer have that money was enough to remind 20% of the people that maybe they shouldn't spend that money. So humans are weird, right? So we had a mean difference of 0.2 between the two different cases, our treatment and our control. The standard error, again, this will be next week. We'll start talking about where this comes from. But for now, just accept that this is what the value is. And then construct a 95% confidence interval. So the last slide said we're going to take our point estimate, plus or minus 1.96 times that standard number in order to get our confidence interval of 95% specifically. And so we take 0 0.20 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.078. And this would be where you'd pull out your hand calculator on the exam and do it. Or if you're in R, just plug it into the console and it'll quickly give you the answers. And that's what I do now. Those two numbers are 0.2 minus 1.96 times 0 0.078 and 0.2 plus 1.96 times 0 0.078. And the end result is those two numbers. 
So we have an interval. So before, all we had was the ability to say 0.2. Our guess for the proportion of the population who will change their minds and who will not buy the DVD or whatever it is when reminded that if they don't spend the money, they still have the money, our guess was 0.2. That was our spear fishing in a murky lake. Our 95% confidence interval is that that reminder will work on somewhere between 4.7 and 35.3% of the population. So if you reminded people of that, somewhere between 5 and 35% of people will change their mind and will go, oh yeah, okay, I need that money, I'm not going to spend it today. So that is a confidence interval, and a, that is a 95% confidence interval. So we are 95% confident that that true value, whatever it is, is somewhere in that range between 0 0.047 and 0.352. So once we have the confidence interval, how often does the population parameter actually fall in the confidence interval? The confidence level. So 95% of the time, the population parameter will actually be in there. 5% of the time, it won't. And this is, again, kind of done in a multiple universe kind of philosophical kind of way. It's saying, if I run an experiment today, and you run an experiment tomorrow, and you run them the next day, and so on, and we all run our own experiments, and we all do 95% confidence intervals, and then they reveal the card, and they say, your true parameter is... 95% of us will have the true parameter inside our confidence interval. 5% of us won't. Same as p-values and type 1 error and that kind of thing. It's all probabilities. It's all talking about repeated events and you know, the, the global universe and multiverse of these experiments. So it's just useful in saying, you know, 95% of the time, this is right. So we're going to go with it being one of those 95% of the times. So you can't predict when this is going to happen. It can completely fail. Um, U.S. presidential election last year, perfect example. Almost everyone's, th this is interesting though, almost everyone's prediction was that Hillary Clinton would win the presidential election. However, the good pollers, the ones who knew what they were doing, always had a confidence interval, which included her losing. It, it never was that it was absolutely 100% guaranteed, no matter how much the news made it seem that way. It was always that, well, she's getting 52% of the popular vote, plus or minus this amount. And actually, she won 52% of the popular vote. However, the Electoral College projections are a little different. And that's where, where the thing came in. She did not win the popular vote in the states of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. And those three states were enough to flip the election from Democrat to Republican. That's a case where they were in a situation where they were in their 5%, right? They predicted she was going to win, 95% confidence interval, blah, blah, blah. But 5% of the time, you're still wrong. And they were wrong. A couple more slides. Uh, we interpret this as we are n percent, 95 percent, 90 percent confidence that the population parameter is between A and B. We do not try to talk about capturing your specific probability or your parameter with a given probability. That goes too far and it crosses the line and it starts to say things that aren't true. So you have to be careful. What you say is it's only how plausible it is that the parameter is actually in there, not that you have captured it with a certain amount of probability. It's, it's kind of, it's the question of who the actor in the sentence is, but the logic and the way that this actually works is that you are able to say, we are a certain percent confident that the population parameter is between A and B. And that is all you really ever say. So be careful and, and, and make your statements clean. Don't say things you don't mean. It's yeah, to be very, very precise. This was our slide. This is the generalized formula. So if you change your confidence, you change your Z star, which means you change your area, and you get a different number, and you compute it again. So on this next assignment, one that's being posted on Friday, uh, I'm going to put a question which just has you compute like five different confidence intervals for the same problem. So it's all the same point estimate. It's all the same standard error. But you just have to figure out five different Z stars and just do it.
This is an example of two confidence. So remember I said the bigger your confidence, the bigger your area. So this is the 95% confidence. It goes to plus or minus 1.96. And this one here goes to plus or minus 2.58 because it's 99%, so it's wider. You can do this using QNORM. We can actually just pump out these numbers, and I expect that you will do so on the next assignment. Now, this is the last definition, the very last thing of the chapter. We often use this Z star standard error bit in our formulas, often enough that we like to merge them into one thing that we can refer to. And so Z star times standard error is referred to as the margin of error shortened as ME. We will use that in the next chapter after your break. Now, a few announcements just before, you, you know, you, we're still early, so let me just do these. We are now at the halfway point. Six assignments are done, or will be very shortly. Five quizzes are done. So we're about halfway down the course. Over the midterm break, I will suck all of the grades down from uh, Pirate at web work and I will put them all on Blackboard so you can check to see that your final grades are actually what you thought they were. Uh, just a reminder about Data Camp. If you haven't been working on it, it is still a way to get bonus marks. So if you have any time over the midterm break and you want to earn some bonus marks, please feel free. And assignment seven will be posted on Friday, but you're not here next Friday. So you get two weeks to do it. So it's due the Friday after you get back. Have a wonderful break.